Welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today, we'll be talking about particular applications in our isentropic flow and normal shockwave module. First, we'll be talking about, very briefly, the isentropic flow through nozzles and, of course, why it doesn't break down even on the on-design condition. Next, we'll spend most of the class briefly talking about, of course, supersonic inlets for high-speed aircraft, that is, air-breathing engines where they ingest supersonic flow in front of the aircraft. And then, we'll talk about particular applications in the ballistic ranges. Let's get started. First, I want to return to the so-called De Laval nozzle performance and its diagram. And we'll be referencing figure 223 in this slide deck, where we see one particular MOC, or method of characteristics to design of a nozzle. You'll remember the nozzle pressure ratio is the key parameter for finding the distribution of the pressures and other fluid dynamic variables as a function of x. As you imagine in reality, the field variables, all of them in fact, depend on the spatial position, x, y, and z, and time. So, we can imagine that for Laval nozzles, we might fix P0 and vary P infinity to obtain supersonic flow. But of course, in this case, we'll have varying field variables everywhere in the nozzle. This is, of course, partly because the viscous effects have been neglected. And in real nozzles, the pressure will rise at the wall due to the so-called normal shocks, which will not be particularly discontinuous as they meet the turbulent boundary layer. Now, a full understanding of the so-called overexpanded or underexpanded or undesigned flows outside the nozzle exit will require shock, oblique shock wave theory and Pratt Meyer theory, which is what we're going to talk about next in this class. Our one-dimensional theory cannot give us an optimal shape of a nozzle. All it's told us is that something about the area ratios and the properties through the nozzle on the center line, even as approximation. But what happens to, of course, to the walls of the nozzle between the exit and the throat, where we want to control the speed and acceleration of the particular fluid for a nozzle case? This isn't, of course, just for nozzles, but really all types of devices with supersonic flow will all have to, of course, take into account this type of variation. And so we show one example calculation from the so-called method of characteristics in the bottom figure. Here, the x-axis is x and the y-axis is the radial direction. The centerline axis is the center nozzle, and right here, this line where I'm moving my cursor, this line is indeed the outside exterior of the nozzle. And so the method of characteristics applied to nozzles gives us a design nozzle called method of characteristics where no shocks are forming inside the nozzle, and it allows the nozzle to operate according to isentropic theory. And you can see that there's a number of lines, and these lines are labeled Mach 1, 1.1, etc. Notice here that the transonic condition, the choke throat, is actually not a straight line, which is, of course, across the throat. It's actually curved and follows a quadratic rule found by, of course, Theodore Meyer, which we'll be talking about in the upcoming classes. You can then see that there's a bunch of checkerboard patterns after, of course, the Mach waves. And these are so-called left and right running characteristic waves, which we'll talk about in a later class. The turning of these characteristic waves defines a wall so that a shock wave or an expansion waves does not particularly form at the nozzle, so that indeed we can have a isentropic flow through the nozzle. So you see our developed theory on isentropics and normal shock waves has already broken down for the classic problem which we have already examined to introduce the subject. Let's now turn our attention to the so-called inlets. Here on the left, I have a particular turning vein which represents an inlet for a wind tunnel, and I've shown particular photos of this earlier. The turning veins are there to try and isentropically and smoothly turn the flow with as little losses as possible through the corners in the wind tunnel. A small person's pictured to give you a size of the scale of the tunnel. On the right, you see one particular F-100 aircraft. Now we're going to turn our attention to the inlets, instead of a supersonic wind tunnel, into a supersonic inlet of an air-breathing jet engine aircraft. And you see in this case, they have a very, very long pitot tube for testing on this F-100 aircraft. And in behind it, they have the actual inlet of the engine. So all the airflow, of course, is going through here through the engine 
core turbines and nozzle. Let's look at another example more closely. Now, for particular supersonic inlets for air breathing engines, the planes must have specifically designed inlets for slowing down the flow from the supersonic free stream from M sum infinity global into some subsonic conditions. Recall that across shock waves, large total pressure losses occur. We would like to maintain as high of a total pressure through the engine as possible and have as little losses as possible as you see the thrust generated from a nozzle requires a very large nozzle pressure ratio which causes of course higher exhaust velocities and therefore higher thrust. So having normal shocks in our system is generally disadvantageous for air breathing engines operating in supersonic conditions. So you'll see that indeed most current turbojet engines will require some kind of supersonic inflow of air, especially in and before the combustion chamber and compressors themselves. So the air in front of the aircraft is supersonic and therefore to deaccelerate it, it could be naively thought that indeed the flow must go through a normal shock. But indeed certain types of inlets are designed to have oblique shocks instead, which of course have lower total pressure losses. This will, of course, deaccelerate the air with less total pressure losses, and this is where inlet design comes into play. Let's look at figure 225. In the lower left is an F86 Sabre inlet. You can see it's round and looks like a guppy, perhaps. On the lower right is a famous F15 inlet, and you'll know that there's, notice there's a long protruding edge on the upper surface. We'll look more at these types of inlets later in the class because the inlet on the right uses the idea of an oblique shock wave and a so-called compression inlet ramp. Nonetheless, we'll look at these two cases in the class. Let's first consider the one in the lower left where, in fact, the inlet face is rather normal to the flow. Let's return and look at one significant aircraft, and I'll try and read this particular caption for you. This is the MiG-17 Fresco, which is a prototype MiG-17 NATO code Fresco, which first flew in January 1950 and is reported exceeding Mach 1 in level flight. Soviet Union produced the MiG-17 ending in 1958 with over 6,000 produced, and they continued to be built and licensed in Poland as the LIM-5P and in China as the Nova 4. The MiG-17 served nearly 30 air forces worldwide, including the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact countries, China, Afghanistan, North Korea, excuse me, Warsaw Pact countries, Sri Lanka, Syria, Morocco, Cuba, Indonesia, and Cambodia. So similar than the US F-86 Sabre, which I just showed on the previous slide, of the Korean War fame, its weight and performance favorably compared to the aircraft of the MiG-17 was for most of the top North Vietnamese pilots, including the leading ace, Colonel Tong. The aircraft in this particular picture, which I'm about to show, is an early MiG-17 built in the Soviet Union in 1953. It came in the museum, the Air Force Aviation Museum in Robbins Air Force Base from the Bulgarian Air Force in April 1991 as part of an exchange with the U.S. Air Force Museum. It was used in the interception and ground attack roles and later as a proficiency trainer by Bulgarian cosmonauts Ivanov Alexandrov. So you can see its characteristics here on the right, which you can review. Let's look at the particular aircraft, which is now housed, of course, in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio which is free to visit for the public, and I encourage you to go. Here's the particular aircraft, and you can see a few things we've already learned in this class. Note it has swept wings, which we'll talk about later. It has, of course, the canopy, and here's one of the pitot tubes, which is on side of aircraft. And then here's the inlet of the aircraft, which is, of course, normal to the front face. You'll see all, per, like, early all early uh, supersonic aircraft, which are of course military based, all of them until the Concorde came for civilian supersonic flight, all had this normal inlet face to the flow. And what happens there is initially when the aircraft accelerates, a shockwave will form. But you know from, of course, wind tunnel um, efficiency studies, which we've done previously, that it's much more ideal to have a shockwave inside the nozzle with a lower Mach number. The question becomes, how do we get it there? Here's where I walked in front of the aircraft a few feet away, the particular one shown in the previous slide deck, and you'll see that indeed the inlet face is almost as large as the fuselage. It has a rounded leading edge and a little divisor in it. Nonetheless, when the aircraft 
it's operating transonically and normal shock wave forms in front of it, which causes large losses. If you look closely inside the nozzle, you can almost see a contour of a converging diverging type nozzle. But this is indeed a diffuser, just like in the supersonic wind tunnels, which we looked at earlier. Ideally, we would want a normal shock wave to reside within the aircraft where I'm showing where the converging diverging nozzle is. And this way, the aircraft would operate at optimal efficiency. Indeed, the power uh, of the aircraft was not high enough even from the engine to drive it through the supersonic condition to swallow that shock easily. And so how did these early aircraft do this? Let's investigate this. Here's some notes about the particular supersonic inlets. Remember, in the simple one-dimensional ideal case, the inlet of an aircraft flying at supersonic design Mach number MD will ingest a stream tube of air. Here the design Mach number of the supersonic inlet, or diffuser in this case, is discussed with a design Mach number, the ideal Mach number which it operates. Ideally, in the lower left, we see this situation in situation one that ideally the Mach number will return to one at the throat from a supersonic ambient Mach number through some particular type of imaginary stream tube. The stream tube of course doesn't exist in front of the aircraft because it's simply, that is, the aircraft's going faster than Mach 1. But we've drawn with dashed lines in situation one these particular dashed lines so that you can get an idea of what this particular uh, flow might look like as if it was a equivalent supersonic wind tunnel. Nonetheless, the flow is choked through some imaginary A1 soup star and supersonic at the inlet. The design Mach number would be the supersonic Mach number at the inlet of the aircraft, right here, to return the flow to be Mach 1, where the flow would then become subsonic and go through a compressor to the core and turbine and, of course, nozzle. Unfortunately, this particular situation is both unstable and impractical. Can you think of a reason why? Now, if the aircraft slows down even a tiny bit, then you can imagine A sub D soup star, that's the choked area at the inlet, will no longer be large enough to swallow the flow. And suddenly a normal shock wave will appear in front of the inlet and the shock will therefore disgorge as shown in figure 230 in the lower right, which we call situation two. Once again, just like the supersonic wind tunnel case, we call this particular situation, indeed, the disgorged shock. Here in this particular situation, we have a supersonic Mach number, but it becomes subsonic because, of course, we have disgorged the shock, and so we'll have a Mach number less than one going in the engine. And we have subsonic flow through the whole engine, and we have a normal shock, which has a strength which is proportional to the M in sim, um, sub infinity to aircraft. This is the worst situation, and it's a very unviolent process known in aircraft engines for supersonics called unstart. It's where the shock is disgorged through the engine and appears in front of the nozzle. This is a very violent and almost instantaneous process for the pilot and the whole aircraft could, of course, have a major problem if this happens. If this does happen, of course, then the engine must have a restart to restart and put the shockwave back in its proper position, at least a normal shockwave for this idealized engine, right after the throat, A sub D soup star of the inlet diffuser. Now, remember an inlet of an aircraft flying at supersonic Mach number will ingest a particular stream tube of air. The other parts of the air not being ingested by the stream tube must go around the aircraft and of course be used to create lift or adjust the ambient air around the aircraft. Now the air will move through a normal shock wave and that shock wave will always become subsonic airflow which will then proceed to the jet engine. In this particular case, is stable since the shock will sit at a diverging channel and it can adjust the strength of small variations in Mach number. And so this is really the situation that occurs in the particular types of aircrafts like the Sabre and the MiG-17. You can see this where the supersonic inflow enters the inlet and a shock wave stands in the divergent part of the inlet itself. Then we have Mach number less than one, of course, and the total pressure is conserved generally because we'll have isentropic flow through the fan face of so the compressor. The major problem now, as you imagine, is how to achieve this particular situation. 
because uh, of course, just like a supersonic wind tunnel, we would have to like start a diffuser and have an area which is large enough to swallow that initial normal shock wave through the inlet. Now one cannot simply accelerate traditionally from rest up to a Mach number as a normal shock will form the inlet and it cannot be swallowed. Indeed, the losses across that shock, which we'll call A2 soup star, will always need to be too large compared to the throat and inlet, and therefore we cannot swallow the shock. To overcome this with an inlet with no moving parts, it would indeed be necessary to create an overspeed m greater than the design Mach number of the inlet in order to swallow the shock. So this is completely impractical, as I noted earlier, because of the deficiencies in the power of the engine. And of course, it will create an enormous amount of drag, which we'll look at earlier in this class with, of course, the so-called sound barrier and the rise of drag as aircraft approach the speed of sound, as a normal shock will be in front of the stalled inlet. And so we would have to accelerate to large speeds to actually achieve this. The most practical solution you'll see is actually to use a variable area and inlet geometry. Indeed, in these types of aircrafts, a throat at low supersonic Mach numbers must be opened in order to swallow the shock. We can then gradually close the throat and move the normal shock back towards the minimum area of the inlet. And therefore, we have swallowed the shock, just like we did in the supersonic wind tunnel case where we have a variable area diffuser. And so you see it's exactly the same concepts. Imagine the researchers at the Penamende wind tunnels in Germany studying supersonics and applying the concepts, of course, to the Measure Schmidt 282, which we'll show later in this class, which of course is the world's first operational jet aircraft. Now this is the process indeed which what high-speed inlets accomplish. Now, in practice, every aircraft which cruises above Mach 2 must have some kind of high-speed variable area inlet geometry to handle this process. For example, an F-15, which I showed earlier in this class, will have such an inlet, and we'll look at how it moves in the class itself when we're talking one-on-one. -on -one. The supersonic aircraft inlets are indeed are not designed by one-dimensional methods described at all. In fact, they're designed with the so-called oblique shock wave theory, which we haven't covered yet. But you'll see that oblique shock waves have lower losses, that is, lower losses and lower gains in entropy and lower losses of total pressure across each shock wave, even at higher supersonic Mach numbers, and especially relative to normal shocks. As we recover and introduce the subjects of bleak shock waves in the next classes, we'll come back to the supersonic inlet design problem and show you how high performance, high speed supersonic inlets are designed in practice. Let's take a few minutes just to review the ideas of shock tubes. Now, remember, a shock tube is a device that produces high pressure, high temperature conditions and breaks a diaphragm where a shock wave travels downstream. They're inherently used for studying moving shocks and thus produce unsteady flow fields. Thus far, we have not considered the unsteadiness behind the flow and the shock wave itself. In the simplest terms, a shock tube is usually either a diaphragm or a high pressure driver which produces the shock. And of course, you can also study expansions. Now there's two sections, remember, are separated by a diaphragm that bursts, and given the pressure ratio, it produces a moving shock wave, which we studied in this class. The properties of the driver and the driven section are always dependent on temperature and pressure and another variable, the thermodynamic problem, classically produced in our curriculum, of course. Now we'll determine the shock wave strengths and other test properties previously. Let's return and just remind us what these shock tubes look like. And I'm doing this review because I want to introduce the idea of the ballistic tunnel. Now the schematic of a shock tube, which I've shown before, is shown in the lower part in figure 232 of this particular slide deck. We have, in practice, a gas supply where we use it to raise a high pressure driver section, we break a diaphragm, and the shock wave moves from left to right in the low pressure section. We might have an observation port where we create these beautiful Schlieren images, and this might exhaust the atmosphere. It might also reflect off walls, in which we also studied this. Remember, 
Shock tubes can be used to produce high shock Mach numbers, up to 15, and high temperature ratios, which are outside the range of conventional wind tunnels. Where might shock tubes be used other than to study shock waves? Well, having this very, very high pressure and temperature test section, we might be able to study particular hypersonic flows, and a whole new class of wind tunnel can be designed, which we haven't discussed yet, to study high speed flows, which are actually shock driven. These are used in contemporary research to study hypersonics. Shock tubes typically last on the order of microseconds before a reflection occurs, as we've shown both in our examples and, of course, our calculations of examples in previous classes, and the Schlieren with time delays tau in a particular images of the reflection shock. Here's one particular shock tube in figure 233 of the slide deck of the University of Florida shock tube. You can see in the lower right is a high speed camera with a window which is used to capture flow phenomena. In the upper left you see a gas bottle which represents the pressure field and it increases the pressure in this part of the tube. Where my cursor is moving is a diaphragm. That diaphragm is broken as shock moves from left to right and then the course experiments measured. So this is an MAEA. Let's now turn our attention to ballistic ranges. Suppose that we're not interested in moving shock waves down tubes, but perhaps changing the gas properties in the tube and firing a projectile or model down the tube. Then we'll look at particular examples of these for reentry physics for space vehicles. Now in the ballistic range, which I show in a diagram below, a so-called gun fires a test model at high speed through a firing range into still air. So here's the outside of the shell and it might be released to a vacuum, maybe, maybe not, depending on the pressure. And on the right hand side, there's a model catcher. On the left hand side, there's a little gun and it shoots our test model, reentry vehicle or bullet or whatever we're testing inside a sabo. The sabo separates, which it just holds the bullet as it travels outside the gun and it travels down the middle of, of course, the ballistic range and it's caught in the model catcher. We have instrumentation and cameras and other uh, scientific instruments to measure the properties as the model goes by. This is exactly the analog to the wind tunnels. However, the frame of reference is simply changed. So take a second and consider the frame of reference change. Take a few minutes and consider the ballistic range outline. Now indeed, very, very fast instrumentation must be created to measure the flight conditions of these particular models. And these studies in ballistic experiments are always done to study and look at either high speed impacts or high speed aerodynamics around particular model vehicles. It's very much possible to fire models down a ballistic range at hypersonic speeds. Indeed, we can even move faster and look at hypervelocity regimes of flow up to perhaps, for example, of models moving at 10 kilometers per second, which as you can see very easily in the range of Mach 20, 30, and even above. In fact, we can drain the air and create a micro vacuum, if you will, inside the pressurized ballistic range and study different atmospheres. For example, the atmospheric reentry at high speeds. Of course, there's no substitute for the actual flight test or actual flight. And it's very much usual that we can never exactly capture all the non-dimensional parameters for similarity studies at these hypervelocity regimes. And this is why computational practices are so important and come into play for these particular studies. Here's one particular ballistic range in a hypervelocity flow. Let's read the caption together. It says, an energy flash is recorded by a camera when a projectile is launched at speeds up to 17,000 miles per hour and it impacts a solid surface at the hypervelocity ballistic range at NASA's Ames Research Center. And so the blue line in the photo, of course, is the stream of plasma. You can see that there's windows and instrumentation ports around the tunnel. Here we see the model exactly striking the surface upon impact. This facility was of course designed to study very, very small models of reentry vehicles as they come through various atmospheres. It's a beautiful facility, and if you're in NASA Ames one day, maybe you'll have the privilege of touring it. Now these particular types of experimental facilities, which are called ballistic facilities, have a certain ranges and different types of guns to launch different types of masses of projectiles at different velocities. On the x-axis we have the so-called muzzle velocity in kilometers per second. 
On the y-axis, we have the particular mass of the projectile, which we might call a projectile plus slug. So if you want to have a very high velocity test, say greater than four kilometers per second, then you need to use the so-called two-stage light gas gun, which is pictured in the previous facility. If you very, very high mass uh, test article, then you would have, of course, maybe a more traditional powdered gun, like the 76 millimeter high performance launcher, which is maybe used like in a howitzer or another type of artillery device, which is very classic. In this class, we briefly looked at some of the problems in terms of our developed isentropic flow theory and normal shockwave theory. And of course, in every one of the cases we studied, the theory breaks down in more complicated physical situations. And now, in the future classes, we'll have to start developing those particular tools. In this particular class, we introduced the idea of the supersonic inlet where a normal shock resides. Researchers developing supersonic aircraft quickly realized that the normal shock inlet, like the F-86 Sabre and the MiG-17, were terribly inefficient. And to go at higher speeds in the arms race of the Cold War, they had to develop, of course, variable area inlets, which we'll need to analyze with oblique shockwave theory. We then briefly looked at a totally new type of wind tunnel, which of course is the ballistic range, which isn't a wind tunnel at all. In fact, it just is a change of reference frame. We're removing the model and holding the air still versus a wind tunnel where we move the air and of course hold the model still. These are still used in practice today and are used to examine re-entry physics of high-speed vehicles on Mars and Earth and maybe other planets in the future. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.